Hey, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Beatrice Rowan. I'm gonna be the Mike slash Oprah girl. I'll be running around in case you have a question so that our people that are on Zoom can hear your questions. So if you have a question, please, you're gonna have to speak into the microphones. Just wave your hand and I'll come over to you um, so we can all enjoy this um, powerful circle. So thanks for coming. Okay, come on, come on in. Um, okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start um, just by asking folks like um, why circle, right? Why do, why do we sit in circle? What, what do you mean? Okay. What well, what do you mean? I was the one who just got blocked out. Now I'm here talking. Okay. Um what is it about the shape that delivers on that? Okay. Um where does the circle start? Where does it end? Okay. Right. Yeah. So um, if you, um, again, if you connect, I think, you know, one of the most important things you can do as an educator um, is to connect to your own indigeneity, right? Really, really spend the time to understand yourself right and who um and and where you come from who your people are right what your um what the teachings were um and we can talk some um about about different ways to do that right there isn't like a playbook right so just please just disabuse yourself of this idea that there's like some like secret like indigenous playbook that is hidden away and that you once you find it like you're you, it, it, it doesn't exist right there's there's just teachings um, but um, I think the more that you really understand who you, I mean, how are you going to guide a young person to understand themselves if you don't really understand yourself, right? Um, and and be committed to that journey, not the end point. Like, oh, this is who I am. Like that. That's not right. The teaching, right? The teaching is that, that you're. It's a seek to go. It's a it's a it's a desire to go inward first. Okay. Um, and it when you do that. Um, if you do that, what you will find inevitably is that um, that your people use the circle, right? So you can go any anywhere in the world, um, and if you um, uh, get connected to the in indigenous people of that place, um, they will have used some version of circle, right? Um, and so, um, and for the reasons that you said, okay. Um, that and so it's this is a much more natural right space to connect in, um, and um, then I want you to think about schools. Okay, and so all the things that you said, like you, I mean, and but I would just push a little bit on on some of what you said because because if you do if you do do circle like you don't have to be vulnerable in circle, right? You can just be present, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very different, forms a very different relationship, right? And there's lots of like neuroscience, right? That backs the teachings of the elders of what, why, right? Why we would sit in circle. Um, so, but what I want you to think about is the ways in which the environment where you do the work, right? So we're talking about these things and you think about, okay, how am I gonna implement this? Um, and the ways in which the very design of school is meant to not allow you to do the work in the way we just talked about. Okay, and, and that begins with the actual structural design of schools. So if you talk to an architect, right, what they will tell you is that the, does anybody know the architectural design model name that they use to describe 
um, when they talk about building schools. So it, uh, it, factory is one of the ones that uses this design model, okay? But it's not called a factory model. What's that? Something right like that, right? Uh, it's uh, called the cell and bell model. So there's three places that use the cell and bell model, right? You, and you just named all three of them, the factory, the schoolhouse, and, and the prison, okay? So um, this is important for you to understand because if you um, are trying to do sacred work, you have to understand when you're inside of a space that by its design is meant to not be sacred, right? And it's meant to construct certain kinds of relationships, not just between you and young people, but between you and your colleagues, between you and your families. So being really conscious about, um, you know, barring having the power to just dynamite your building and then reconstruct a new one, um, it's, it's right. Sure. That's maybe most ideal, maybe not, but, um, but I think just awareness about how the space literally affects the body and the brain, which then affects the nature of learning. Okay. Um, so, um, there's, there's no right way to do circle, right? Some different people teach it different ways. So, um, I'm going to teach you the way in which I was taught. Um, because that's part of what we do. Like we receive right teachings from our elders, um, and then we are expected to kind of like the cat bat hat thing, right? We're expected to then right drop the screen and and share those teachings because we're teachers. Okay, so um, but I want to say before I share with you how I was taught circle um, that um, this does not mean it's the way to do circle. Okay, so. It, again, it's take the best, leave the rest, mix your medicines, right? Your your elders, right? Your community, your ancestors might teach you a different way. And that's all dope, okay? Um, do it in a way that makes sense for you and your community, okay? So um, one of the ways that I was taught um, is no open spaces, okay? So this would go and you would come, this would go and and you would come and we'd tighten, tighten up, okay? And in like in like a, a circle where the elders were really running it and it wasn't like a, a, a camera and zoom and like, like, like this would not happen, right? Because this this right is the other side of things. So so what's happening right now, right? Um, is that you're invisibilized and you're invisibilized, right? And and so are you because she's looking at the back of your heads, right? And so when you're speaking, right, she's gonna receive, right, your palabra, she's gonna receive your word differently than if she were in the circle, right? And as is true, so so again, this is the mixing of medicines, right? This is technology and it isn't necessarily bad, but it does change dynamics, okay? Um, so you just, you, know, you just work with it and you massage it, but you acknowledge it, right? You don't pretend that that this isn't happening. Right. You just you name it. Right. And then and then people are like, instead of feeling some way about it, they're just aware of it. Right. And it's been named and it's been brought into the circle. OK. Um, so um, in a classroom, right, in 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 the space we were just in, like lots of people were invisibilized in different ways. OK. Um, whereas in, in this space, right, there is no beginning. There is no end. Um, there is no center. Right. There is a center. Right. But the center, like we all have uh, equal and equitable access to the center. And when you speak your palabra, it goes to the center for anybody to take, right? Or leave, right? Okay. So um, so that would, uh, I'm actually going to, is somebody there? She, she left. Okay, cool. Oh, do, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Feed the babies. <laughs> yeah. Or they will eat you. <laughs> um, so, um, so this is like really good what she, what she did. I don't know if you are conscious about what you did. Well, okay. So, so um, but usually like if somebody needs to leave the circle, um, then you can either leave something, right? Or when you leave the circle, um, you, you leave the circle, they close, right? And then when I come back, then, then they just reopen and I come back in, okay? So those are different ways. So anyway, so I... I did circle all the time with my um, with my high school classes, 
um, including that class where you you heard um, my uh, student share. Um, and then um, and then one of the young people was like, "What about what about all the people that aren't here that are supposed to be?" Uh, because you know we're from East Oakland. There's a, a lot of premature death, right? A lot of adolescent uh, death, um, often from from gun violence. Um, and so I was like, "Hmm." And and I said, "Well, well, they're they're here, right? All our ancestors are here, right? So those young people are our ancestors." Um, but the, the students were like, "No, we need we need a, a space for them." Um, and I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? And they said, bring a chair. So we do this now in our community because of the, and this is cultural perpetuity, right? This is the ways in which young people take our teachings, right? It comes down to them, right? And then they grow a little differently, right? And they, they add to it or change it, right? Um, and so um, understanding that the, the, none of these teachings are like sacrosanct. Right, that they're meant to be owned by right the the young people so that they can make it their own, okay, and continue to advance the the cultura, okay. So another teaching of of my tío, my Esther Jerry Teo, um, it, he said he teaches us la cultura cura. So you all may have heard that you may have they may have been to some of your schools and like you have the la la cultura cura poster up or whatever. So what does that mean? Not a trick question. What? Huh? Okay. But what what is the what what is the language la cultura cura? Okay, right. So most people will say not what you said, right? But they'll say that the culture cures, right? Because that's the literal translation. But it's not actually right the teaching, right? It's it's more right that your your culture is your medicine. Okay. So if young people are not allowed to bring their cultura into school, what, what happens to them? What happens if you can't bring your medicine? You get sick, right? And it's not that, that the cultura of school isn't also medicine, right? But the way that you stay well, right, and continue to be well is by mixing medicines. So what's happening in schools is school is a cultura, it is a culture, right? And it is medicine. But have you ever had medicine shoved down your throat? Okay, you don't feel better, right? You feel sick. So thinking about creating environments where um, we're all medicine people and we all, right? But if, if young people don't know their cultura, right? If they don't know their medicine, then it's harder for them to mix medicines. Okay, so this is why the project of ethnic studies is so important, because it begins to like widen young people's gaze to just how much medicine they were born with, right? And it begins to help them to understand that we can't teach them math. We can't teach them reading or writing. You can't teach something to somebody that's their birthright, right? These are the original mathematicians, the original engineers, the original medical like that, that's who's right if you believe in the seven generations principle if you believe right that these young people really are beautiful right from incredible traditions it's not just right lip service you really believe that then you also understand i can't teach you math i can only pull it out of you right it's already there right your ancestors gifted you the concept of settle right? Your ancestors gifted you the ability to build a pyramid, right? You can't, you can't build a pyramid without geometry. You can't build a pyramid without engineering. You can't build a pyramid without physics. There's only two places on the planet where there's pyramids. Where are they? Okay. Yeah. Egypt and South America. And it's always interesting to me that people will say Egypt, right? Um, which is like geographically factual, but instead of saying Africa, right? And, and so the two, right? So there's pyramids in Africa and there's pyramids in South America, right? Now, it's also well known historically and anthropologically that the concept of settle, the idea that you can measure nothingness mathematically, right? The number zero comes from where? The Mayans, okay? Can you build a pyramid without settle? 
no, right? You can't get the math right. So um, if the Mayans uh, developed the concept of Cerro and um, there are pyramids in Africa, both of which anthropologists say emerged around the same time, how is that possible? When no cell phone, when no Zoom calls, like, yo, man, I got this pyramid project going on. Yeah, us too, right? How did it happen? Yeah, right, right. It's got to be aliens, right? I mean, yeah, right. We traveled, right? Our young people don't, aren't taught this in their math class, right? How many of you took a chemistry class? Okay. Where does the, where does the concept of chemistry come from? Where? Nope. No clue. <laughs> but you took chemistry, yeah. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Just the periodic table and you're good, right? Yeah. 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 You, you don't need to understand shit because then you might actually become a chemist, right? Huh? Al Al alchemy? Madame Curie. No, Madame Curie. No, way before Madame Curie. The witches way before. Where? Wasn't the Middle East. Alchemy came after. The term chemistry comes from chemet. That's why it's called chemistry, right? Because the original chemists were in ancient chemet, which is where? Africa. Okay, so the original chemists were, were Africans. So, um, so people, indigenous people from South America, right, are, are, are likely, right, in relationship with indigenous people from, from Africa and vice versa. So um, no united, right, no, no international airway. So how are they getting them? Boat, okay. And so to navigate that, what, what must you... No, right, which means you also have to know really complex math, math, right? Because they ain't using ways. They're not using like Google Maps, right? They're navigating, right, using mathematics, all kinds of geometry, right, and knowledge of the skies to, to get to each other. Now, because they're on a boat, right, they get there and then they're there for a long time, right? It's not, this is not a flip trip, right? So. Um, so during the day, right, they're exchanging knowledge, right? They're, they're teaching each other. They're building. What are they doing at night? Yeah, making, babies. making babies, right? This is why you see this incredible, right, hue of humanity, right, in all these different places because we've been, but our young people don't know this, that we've been sleeping together, right? We've been in family. We've been in community, right? long before any of this beef started on our blocks, right? It's, it's a trick. It's a trap it, that you fall prey to if you don't really know who you are and you don't really know who you come from and you don't understand your connectedness to your brother and sister that's sitting across from you because that's not what we... When you ask young people, close your eyes, describe a chemist to me, right? They'll almost never, right, describe an African person right? Describe a mathematician. They'll ne almost never describe, right, an indigenous person. So this is why, right, these, these teachings are so important, right? Not just because they're like slick ethnic studies, you know, it, it's because it literally connects people to their ancestors, okay? It connects people to their medicine, it, it, and it stops giving all the power to the institution that you don't know any math, right? But instead, like, honors the fact that all I can do is share with you what your ancestors taught us, right? And that's your birthright, right? And so um, one other thing to think about um, with, with, with respect to this is that, that really helping young people understand um, via that, right, knowledge itself, okay, um, that the ways in which they're, they're connected to things that school tends to hold them hostage around, right? Or play a gatekeeper to. So where was the first university? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, San Jose State would love to be the first. No, no, not even close. Timbuktu, which was where? Yeah. So we can't get black and brown kids to universities when they founded universities. Like they are the original post-secondary educational right communities, but they don't know this. Right. So they think university is like some distant, right, right, not connected to them or their family. And then we start calling them first generation. Right. You're first gen. You're first. How can you be first gen when you created it? Like you are first gen because you created it. Right. All these other clowns, right? They're the new gen. Right. You're the first gen. So it's just about reworking, right? The ways in which we think about connecting our young people to knowledge that then create, it's the connection that creates readers, right? It's the connection that creates purpose. It's a connection that creates that self-actualization where they wanna know more and more and more. And that's part of, needs to be part of all of our journeys too, right? That us continuing to sit with the elders and sit, right, with, with the knowledge and sit with the history to learn more and more about ourselves. Because the more we're connected, the easier it is for us to connect the person to the right and to the left, right? But if we are teaching this to young people and we have no connection to our own indigeneity, right, in our own stories, then what are we doing, right? We're just playing games with them. Because if it's not important to us, if we're not doing that for ourselves, why should I do this, right? You ain't doing it. You don't know shit about yourself, right? But I got to learn my history, right? And this is where, right, we have to start with us, right? Start with self, go inward, right? And be on that journey, right? With your young people, with the families um, to, um, to really start creating those connections, okay? And some of it is just by how you structure things. And some of it is by what you actually put in their hands, right, to read. Some of it is the kind of questions you're going to ask them to, right, the projects they're doing, et cetera, okay? A um, couple other things to think about that have been shared with me, and then we'll, we'll open it up for reactions and reflections. Um, so um, one of the, the, the uh, another teaching from, from another one of my elders Samuelin, he's the uh, he's the Mexicayo firekeeper for our community, um, which means he has a lot of um, medicine, right? Like ancient, like medicine, like old medicine that's been passed on and passed on and passed on. Um, and um, and so we were we were in a conversation with um, there was a group of elders in our community um, that convened a, a group of us. Um, that um, at the, this was maybe, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, and um, when I was, uh, did not have gray and I wasn't like walking that line, right, to be an elder. Um, and, um, and, but they brought a group of us in that were all around my age. Um, and, um, and they called us the Yelders. Um, and, we were like, okay, cool. That's that's better than being an elder, right? <laughs> and and we're like, well, what is a what is a yelder? And they said that the yelder is the young elder. And we're like, well, what what does that mean? Like, what is our role? And they said, what we're realizing as elders in the community um, is that our message is slipping past young people, right? They can't hear us because we're elders. And um, and they said, you're the bridge keepers. Because you can hear us and you're connected enough with the youth where you can, you can bring the message to them and they'll receive it, okay? So, um, so in that conversation with the elders and the elders, um, one of the questions that came up was, you know, like, Theo, how, um, uh, how do we, how do we, how do we, like, um, understand our cultura how do we how do we learn that like so much of it was taken from us some of us right is is like intentionally buried our names have been changed like my, my son's names are amaru and tayari my name is jeff right <laughs> and my name is jeff because my mother's name is ada and when she she grew up in the in, in la frontera and the border right and when she went to school they changed her name um and 
So she didn't want that for her children, right? So she, she anglicized our names because my mom didn't have ethnic studies, right? And she just knew the pain of that humiliation and was like, there's no way there, that's going to happen to my sons. But I got ethnic studies, right? So in one generation, right, we reclaimed our naming process, right, for, for our babies. Um, and, then, and then we teach them, right, about you don't let people change your names, right? Um, and that's happened in one generation, right? There, and there's still people, especially with Tayari. I don't know why people have such a hard time with his name, um, but um, they everybody wants to call him Ty. You know, can I, can I, can I get, and this is happening a lot now that he's getting into sports, right? And he's got these white coaches who are like, you know, they go, okay, what's your name? It's like, Thomas, you know, what's your name? You know, Jeff, right? What's your name? Tayari, what? <laughs> Tayari, what? Say, say that again. Slow, slow down. T -t -t I'm, I'm just going to call you T, right? And so armoring him up, equipping him, right? With what do you do with that, right? Because he's 10 and he wants to fit in. He doesn't want to be the kid with the weird name, right? And, and yet he knows that his name, right? Because we, we taught this since he was an infant. His name means essence of the ancestors. So they're literally like taking the essence of the ancestors away by changing your name. And it's not about telling him what he needs to do. It's about asking him, what do you do? What did the ancestors want from you? What do you want for you? How do we, right? How do we navigate that, right? Um, and so his thing has become to like teach people to do private lessons, <laughs> right? And he just works one at a time, right? So he's like, okay, homie, like you're going to be the first one to actually say my fucking name right in this team, <laughs> right? And, and so he looks for the people that are like, they actually, the kids that actually want to know how to say his name. And then the kids start correcting the coach. They're like, no, 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 His name is Tayari. And the coach is like, Tayari. Oh, Tayari. Yeah. Right. And then, so it's been really interesting because I, I wanted him to like take the warrior route. Like, no, no, no stop. But my, you're going to say my name right, man. It's like, Jeff, he's 10. Like, give him a pass. Right. So anyway, so we're asking our Theo, right? Like, how do we, um, how do we get all the lessons? And he says, um, he says, that's one of the traps, right? That you, because you go to these Western schools that teach you about, this is how history works. And there's a book, there's a beginning and there's an end, right? And it's all chronological. And, and he's like, if that's not possible because when the colonizers came, our cultura, our medicine, was a clay pot, right? And it was whole and it was pure, right? And then contact came, and, and, right? And when the colonizers came, they took our clay pot and they smashed it on the ground and it scattered everywhere in the world, right? It went to the Caribbean and it went to Africa and it went to Australia and it went to Europe, right? And it went to North America. And um, so if we did that, like literally, if we took the metaphor and made it real and, and, and like I took your clay pot and I smashed it, could you ever rebuild that clay pot? Okay, not like that. And he says, that's the mistake they made. Because they smashed all our clay pots and they brought us together. And he said, and, and this is like his, his kind of humor. He said, what they didn't realize when they buried us in their bullshit is that we are seeds. We are seeds. And what is literally, what does bullshit do for seeds? It's fertilizer, right? And he said, so the way that we do it is first, right? You do your own work, right? First, you meet with your elders. Like think about who the elders are in your life, right? And, and, and meet with them. And, and, sit and, and listen, right? And, and ask them, what are the stories I need to know, right? What are the lessons I need to learn, okay? And, and the thing about elders is, and I've realized this is a becoming more of an elder, is that as an, as an elder, you tend to repeat the same stories over and over, right? And then the <laughs> elders and the youth get super pissed off, right? They're like, you, you know, like, Theo, you told me that story already, right? And he's like, I did. And you need to hear it again. <laughs> and it's like, damn it. Right? So um, 
So go again and again and again to your elders, right? And, and continue to hear the story and you'll take a different piece of the story or suddenly like because of what's happened in the last week or two weeks since you met with, right, with your elder, you'll have a different question about the story, right? Because the ancestors will start, right, pushing you in different directions or your children will push you in, or your community will push you in different directions. And so the same story will teach you a different lesson. And it, that story is a piece of your clay pot. Okay, and so you, you build as much of your clay pot as you can, because those pieces, they didn't fly away to another continent, they stayed close. Okay, and then your clay pot will have all kinds of holes, right, it will be gapped, it will be, right, and then, okay, you start connecting, right, with other people, and mixing medicine. Because you got a piece that I need for my pot, and I got a piece that you need for your pot, and you start thinking about what are the holes in my pot? Right. And he says, what happens then, right, is your pot becomes a mosaic. And they never thought that we would get even stronger by being able, right, to learn. And this is the potential power, right, of a, an educational system that really connects young people to who they are. It's not just going to be about them, but then they become, right, what, what Goody Mob, you all know who Goody Mob is? No, okay, no hip hop heads in here. Okay, so Goody Mob, hip hop group from Atlanta. Um, it's, their name is an acronym. This is how I teach acronyms to my high school kids. They never forget it, right? So I teach the way I literally I taught a acronym was through Thug Life. You know, Tupac's right. Thug. It's an acronym, right? That stands for the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. And kids never ever forgot what acronym was, right? One lesson done. It's forever, but you know. And then they love to tell everybody what an acronym is because they get to say fuck, right? <laughs> they're like, can I tell my parents that? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Okay. And I get all these phone calls. Yeah, what are you doing? But and, so Goody Mob, also an acronym, uh, Goody Mob stands for the good die mostly over b bullshit or God is every man of blackness. So Goody Mob um, has this concept that they taught me that is um, going from understanding to overstanding. And first you must understand something. And then when you understand it, you have a responsibility to overstand it, right? And overstanding means you teach it to somebody else, okay? So that, that's, right, that's the principle behind the ways that we teach ethnic studies. It's not just about you. It's about community actualization, right? But for you to contribute in that way to your community, right, you have to study, right? And we, we quote Paulo Freire, we say, to study is a revolutionary duty. You don't study for better grades. You don't study to go to college. Those will happen, right? Or, or, they, or they don't or they won't, right? You study because it's your responsibility. And that's a very different way to think about teaching reading and writing and math, right? It's not for some like short-term gain, right? It's an actual, right, ancestral responsibility and right that is was given to you at birth, okay? So... Um, all that, right, is um, the way in which we use circle, right? Continually teaching those lessons, reminding people, right, about why we gather, right? What's, what's the purpose? Um, it's not for some short-term gain. It's for community actualization, right? Okay, so um, let me pause there. And then we, we, co we covered a lot in the uh, keynote, right? And then I, I gave you a little more you know, medicine in circle. So now I just want to kind of open it back up to questions, wonderings, reflections that you all, um, while you have me here, that you want some thought partnership on. Yeah, yeah, this happens a lot with um, 
with indigenous practices from all over the world, right? It's it's just classic cultural appropriation. You can't you can't do an RJ circle if you don't even know why you're in circle, right? And you don't know the millennial tradition, right, behind just the shit, right? And 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 the young people can't do it if they don't know why they're in circle, right? Again, back to Malcolm's thing about history. So I imagine like a lot of you, right, have some kind of RJ, right, thing in your school. Um, so so let's just do a quick, right, I want you to know the history of RJ. So where does this concept of restorative practices uh, originate from? The one that is so common in our schools now. Does anybody know? But where? New Zealand, here, the Miwok people, yeah. Australia. So the one that's most commonly used in schools is from the Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, okay? Um, and I've spent 20 years with them. Um, I took students from East Oakland to um, uh, Maori land. And then, so we, pre-pandemic, um, we would uh, trade off every year. So one year, we East Oakland would go to um, a, a community called Otara, which is just outside of Auckland. Um, to a Maori uh, indigenous school called um, Te Whano Utu Paranga. Um, and then the, in the other, the next year, they would come and bring their community to East Oakland. So we did that for, for almost 20 years before the pandemic. Um, and so um, what happens in U.S. schools is not RJ. Okay, and, and, and because it can't. So I've seen RJ. From the from the originators of the, the the practice right in in the Maori and the way that they used it okay um, and that doesn't make it bad right or wrong it just means it's not RJ right and and it's so first of all right there's an indigenous name for it that is not restorative justice so the minute you change something's name you change right the medicine okay so um, I watched RJ so let me tell you what it looks like um, in uh, in this school, in, 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 in Te Whano o Tuparanga, which means, Te Whano means family in Maori. Tuparanga is the, is the indigenous name for the land that the school is on. So the school is called Te Whano o Tuparanga, right? Which literally means the family of this land, okay? Um, and, um, and they don't have yellow, brown, and blue, right? They're, they're the family, okay? <laughs> so... Um, when there's a, a conflict, right, that needs that medicine between two kids, between, so they bring families, right? Um, if, if there's like a conflict between the family and the community, then the school handles it. They will bring the family in. And um, they have a sacred building called a murai, okay, where, um, where all uh, RJ practice happens, okay? Because it's a sacred practice. So it has to happen in a sacred space where it's adorned with the, the ancestors, right? Back to the first ancestor of that land is watching them do this process. And the kids can tell you, like, which ancestor this is, which ancestor this is, which ancestor this is. So um, let's say there's a conflict between kids that, that, that is brought into this process. So they come in, right, with the, the, the uh, adult facilitators um, and their families come. And they sit in circle, and then they break bread together. So they, they eat, right? They, they, and, um, and the process can take days. Because it's not like, you're sorry, right? Yeah. You accept their apology, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, right. It's like no. This is a deep wound, right? That we need to keep peeling the layers back on, right? Um, and um, so the the cooks from the community will stay there, and the families will stay there. They will sleep in the murai. You do not leave. There's no clock on it, right? There's no oh, this is second period started, right? Got to go or call your teacher. Like no. Everything stops because woundedness, right, makes the whole community sick. So everything stops. Nothing, no reading, no writing, no math, 
right? Because their teaching is first your modi, first your modi. And until you understand that and what that means, anything else I teach you is a waste of time because you will interpret every text you read through someone else's eyes. You will learn math through someone else's eyes. You will never become a mathematician. You will never become a writer. You will never become a scientist because those things, they're not mechanical, they're identities, right? We teach the mechanics of reading and writing and math, right? And this is why kids don't really know reading, writing, and math. They just know how to, how to be schooled. So RJ, right, is a lot the same. So they would literally take days where the, they would bring them meal after meal after meal after meal, right? And then you might get three days into the process and be like, actually, now we realize like your deal needs to be here. There's somebody like key player, right? And then the deal has to come. So um, that's the difference between a school. Now, this is a public school in a British schooling system, right? That has ripped up its foundation and says, this is the foundation, right? Your wellness above everything else. And we can teach reading with that as the centerpiece. We can teach, you can teach any of the mechanical concepts, right? But you can't do it the other way around. So if you have a, a model that is about an institutional relationship with children, an institutional relationship with pain, an institutional relationship with the community, and then you try to bring in this sacred practice, ain't gonna happen, right? The sacredness has to be first, okay? And that's, that's in the center. You say, this is, this is our purpose. Why do we take children from their families? Right? We don't. We don't take children from their families, right? This is a family. And why are they coming here? Right? It's to learn knowledge of self for self-actualization so that the community can actualize so we can have cultural perpetuity. That's what we're doing. Okay, then what should we read? That drives your literacy curriculum. That drives your math curriculum. That drives your science curriculum. That drives PE. That drives lunchtime, right? What you feed them. And if you don't do that foundational work, then you're laying these practices like RJ, like equity, like ethnic studies, on top of a rotten foundation. So the metaphor I often use, how many of you own a home? Okay, so when you, when you bought your home, what was the first thing you had inspected? Why not the roof or the double pane windows or the state of the art kitchen or the hardwood floor? Why the foundation? Yeah, right? You're throwing good money after bad. So we keep all these new programs, all these investments, right? How's that going for us in schools? Because the foundation's rotten, right? The, the history, the foundational history of public schools in this country is rotten to its core. And so now we bring in the equity program, right? Now we bring in the social justice. Now we bring in the RJ. Now we bring in the ethnic studies and we lay it on top and we can't figure out why it's not transformative. It's because the foundation is super unstable. But if we can clear the foundation, right, and have clarity of purpose, this is why we are here, right? Then bringing ethnic studies in, right, can, can be pure. Then bringing RJ in can be pure because it's always connected back to one thing. And you're not going to get distracted by time on task because that is on task, right? Making sure that this process adheres to its sacredness and that everybody leaves this, leaves this space more well. Right. That is really hard to do, even when like we started a school, the Rose and Concrete Community School. Right. Where that was that was it. Right? Yeah, hard, hardest thing I've ever done in, in the work. So hard because everybody has this vision about what those things look like. Right. And then. Right. And then when it tries to come together, right, it's super messy. Right. So. I'm not offering you a panacea here, but what I am saying is that if you really want these commitments that you're making, right? RJ, your new literacy program, right? You have to be really clear about what the foundation is, okay? What is the purpose of that work? And if that purpose is misaligned with the purpose of the school, then you'll always feel wonky, right? You'll always feel a little off balance. 
because they're, it, it's the energy, right, of the space. So um, it's a journey, right? It's a process that I think that what I encourage people to do is don't think about a system sweep, right? Think about a pilot project. So start with a really small space and figure out in your space, what would it mean to repurpose this space? Right? It might just be one classroom, right? It might just be one room, right? It might just be one part of recess or whatever, but start small and learn what does it take? Because you're not starting from scratch. You're inheriting, right? The name of the school, you're inheriting all the harm that's been done on that land, right? You're inheriting all of that. And so the limpia or the cleansing, right? Has to sm start small and then learn learn okay what happens when we do this in this community in this way okay and then you take those learnings right that's cultural perpetuity you take those learnings and you go to the second space and the second space is a little bit better and it's a little bit different because it's a different space that's how you you shift your institution and the ways in which schools think about school change is they try to like make a policy right everybody's going to do rj oh shit everybody ain't ready for rj right and now you got people doing RJ that aren't ready for RJ, and now RJ gets a bad name, right? And kids are like, man, RJ, right? That's bullshit. Like, they just want us to, like, say we're sorry, right? And we'll handle this shit in the streets, right? So it's same with ethnic studies, same with cultural responsiveness, right? Like, it, I think really doing, like, a, an asset mapping of your space and understanding, like, where is the space that's really ready for this? And then taking your time to really understand, right, what that means for the larger space where you do the work. That's why I said you can't policy your way out of this, right? You got to people your way out of this, right? You got to place your way out of this. And so um, when you think about the, 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 what it means to, t and this is often very unsatisfactory to people, right? Because it's like, but, but I need my school to change. Okay, so I want to just to challenge your thinking about that a little bit. What does that mean for your school to change? So in my first book that I wrote with Ernest Morell, in our first chapter, we, we, uh, we talk about the fact that um, part of the, pro part of the, the, the reason that's, that school transformation or school reform has been, had so little impact is because of the way in which we conceptualize it. So we begin, like when you think about school reform and school transformation, we begin with a, with a perspective that the school is, is broken, right? And we got to fix it. And we got to fix our reading program. We got to fix start, right? Um, so what if it's not? And the reason I say that it's not is because you're not broken if you're doing what you're designed to do. And the way that I know schools are not broken is because you can tell me any school in the country, like literally any school in the country. And all you have to do is tell me who goes there. And in September, I will predict achievement. And in June, I will be right. I don't need to look at their website. I don't need to visit the school. I don't need to make any phone calls. You just gotta tell me who goes there. Now, you could probably find me a couple schools, right? They're outliers but I will be right way more than I'm wrong. And that's because the schools where we serve are systems in balance. And systems in balance produce predictable results. Systems out of balance produce unpredictable results. So if you work in a school where when this school year started in August or September, you already knew who was gonna struggle, who, that is not a broken school. That is a school that has balanced itself against its reality. So real transformation, right, is about disruption, knocking it off of balance. So if you think about a balance scale, like think about the scales of justice, okay, and they're balanced, right? And you got uh, space X. Oh, let's try that again. You got <laughs> space one, two, three, four, five, right over here, right? That's, that's tipping things this way and space seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 is tipping the, and, and together, right? They create balance, okay? What would you need to do to knock it off balance? How many spaces would you have to shift? Okay, so think of, right? And then, and then let gravity work. 
So if you shift it in, in the good way, we'll just say left, right? It's a little more uncomfortable for the right now because gravity's pulling them, right? But when you try to get all this over to here, it never works, right? That's when you meet all this resistance and, and then everybody's frustrated. And this is like, this doesn't work, right? So what you wanna think about is, what is where are the spaces that are ready for the shift, right? And then do the work of really understanding though, how do I shift that space, right? Maybe one RJ space where you really do some intentional study and learning about what makes it work, right? What doesn't make it work, right? And how do we then share that learning with, with, with the next group or the next group and the next group? And suddenly, right, you become a space where kids are talking differently about RJ, right? Not that they talk badly about it at your school, right? But you, you get what I mean, okay? So um, I think those are two really important things, right? Understanding, right, the history of the, of the actual piece that you're using, right? I see this with land acknowledgments all the time. Everybody wants to do land acknowledgments, right? So we've got to start every meeting with a land acknowledgement. And it's like, do you even know why we do land acknowledgments? What, what is a land acknowledgement? Right? You, you, really? Right, so it's like you acknowledge the the that this is indigenous land that we're on, and right, and and which is, but and then they don't know why they do it, and so it becomes pro forma, right, and then this bastardizes the medicine, right, it toxifies the medicine because it's not true, right, you're just doing it because that's the right, that's the lay of the land right now, right, um, instead, like every time you do a land acknowledgement, you should reteach it. This is why we do this. Right? This is what it means to acknowledge a land. And do you have permission? Like you can't, do you actually have permission from the people whose land you're on to do a land acknowledgement? Right? right? Like we, so this is right how these practices, right, that are, right, the path, right, that are medicinal get corrupted, right? This is, and our young people sniff out that bullshit. Because they're like, you all are not about this. Like, I watch how you treat each other, right? I watch how you treat my homie, and I know what he's going through. I know how much pain he's in, right? And he comes here, and you treat him like shit. You throw him away, right? You talk about him bad. And so no way I'm going to trust you with my pain. And, and what we don't realize is that's a very natural human thing. When you come into a space wounded, you usually sit back and watch to see how other wounded people get treated. And once it becomes clear that this is not a place that's safe to be wounded, you check out like fully, right? So um, I think that, that I, I love that you're being reflective, right? And, and, but I, and I think that's the really important teaching to take back to your team, right? Is we need to un really understand what we're doing here. Otherwise it's not medicine, right? It's just performance. And don't perform cultura, right? Because then it's not medicine anymore. Other, yeah. But um, I'm just reflecting and thinking about how the transportation teacher education is only going to teach I really want to do that. Mm -hmm. and then realizing I'm not really a teacher I'm a sorry I have to do this I don't yeah. yeah because they can't hear you oh oh because I'm not a really a teacher I'm the shower how-to person and so I tell the kids all the time you are the teacher and I just show you how to do stuff mm -hmm. and but it's, I'm very moved, and I'm also thinking, man, do you go to Florida? And do you like? Are you are you preaching? Are you you're, you're basically a preacher? And 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 I think that our country needs we need this discussion. Mm -hmm. And I can't talk. Yeah, um, I I say I come when called, right? <laughs> And it's interesting, the spaces that are calling more now, right, are places like Florida and are places like Texas, because there's people there that have been doing this work for a long time, and now they're under really intense attack, right? They always sort of been like in those spaces, right, been under some attack, 
but now it's they're really reaching out, right, for support and, and more importantly for solidarity, right? To say, hey, pay attention to because it's it's coming to you next, right? There's that old saying about that um, Protestant priest that was um, uh, around during uh, the Nazi regime, and they they interviewed him after um, you know all this incredible death, right? Um, and uh, and they asked him like you know like how did this happen on your watch? Like you're a priest. Right. And he said, I'll tell you how it happened on our watch. When they came for the Slavics, I said nothing because I wasn't Slavic. And when they came for the sick and the infirm, I said nothing because I wasn't sick and infirm. And when they came for the Jews, I said nothing because I wasn't Jewish. And when they came for me, there was nobody left to say anything. So I, I think about that, like, you know, thank goodness, like I'm working in the Bay Area. Right. And, and not in, 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 in Florida. Right. But then like, oh, what is my responsibility then to support them, right? And also to acknowledge that um, the Bay has its own issues, right? Like uh, black and brown kids, indigenous kids, right? Poor kids in the Bay Area do just as poorly as school, in school as, and in, in health outcomes as those kids in Florida, right? So I can point the finger at Florida all I want, but we, we got all this, uh, we sell in all kinds of wolf tickets. We have all the social justice rhetoric, but it's not real, right? And, and that's where, like, it's good that we can have these conversations, um, but if it never manifests into real fundamental transformation and change for kids, then it's just, right, it's just aspirin, you know? Yeah. Okay. What I wanted to say is it's not just Florida. Like, in I work in Santa Clara Unified, and on the first day of my elementary school, our first opening day, we were flyered by Silicon Valley par informed parents or informed parents of Silicon Valley, which are the uninformed parents of Silicon Valley um, that have allied themselves with a group you might know, Moms for Liberty. Um, and they are making moves. Um, Fremont, they're making moves in Santa Clara Unified. They are all over the Bay Area right now. Yeah. And what they are trying to do, what their plan is, is to take over our school boards. Yep. So like, and I've had people say, oh, that's not going to happen here. And, and the thing is, is that there's actually a lot of quietly right-wing people in the Bay Area. There's a lot of eugenicists here. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk, for example, is a eugenicist. Um, so there's like a lot of, the racists are just more quiet now. They just learned how to not say the trigger words, but they say it in subtle ways and it's dog whistles and it's subtlety. Mm -hmm. um, but they are organized and they have money and they are here yeah. and they are coming for our curriculum and they are coming for our children. Yeah, that's right. um, and if we're not awake to it, um, it will happen. Yeah. It, so, well, it is, as you said, it is happening right, yeah. right, right on our watch. And, yeah. And I think that um, there's the work that we do, right? But all the more important that we do this work with our babies, right? So that they're, because, the, you know, they're they're spending large percentages of their time not with us, right? And in this social media world, right? And in this, right? And on the streets, right? And and we have to armor them up for right. We we can't just think about creating this safe space of school, right? But to to really create a space where what they're learning prepares them for what's coming, right? Um, or or what's here already. Throw it. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to switch it up a little bit and ask you to speak a little bit more about um, measurement and assessments and matrix. Um, I run an organization and we do support school districts with restorative practices, justice. And I created an assessment that they're happy with. <laughs> I'm not because I, you know, I know how complicated it is. Like, how do you measure healing? How do you measure relationship building? How do you measure, how do you measure these things that are not, you know, typically quantifiable in, in, you know, in our academic terms or world? Um, and it's, that's, I'm just, it's, a, it's hard for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so when we started 
uh, our community school, um, you know, in, in our charter, we were very clear that we um, that we were not invested in this the the state's metrics, um, and that we were being uh, designed as a lab school that would uh, take on this challenge that, that right that we're all talking about here that to to literally like rip up the foundation um, and center wellness as our singular charge for the children and the families that we serve. Um, and um, as we got to the renewal period, um, they were like, okay, well, show us your test scores. And we're like, did you not read our charter? <laughs> you didn't read our charter, did you? <laughs> you just looked at our website and like, you know, rubber stamped this, you know, guy that runs all over the country with a mic and and because you wanted the Roses and Concrete Community School, right, on Oakland's watch. And what happened was, is the speaking of school boards, the the politics of the school board shifted from when we got authorized to when we went back up, and um, and suddenly it was people who were like much more interested in like metrics and right, um, and so um, that was a really like profound lesson, right? For, uh, because they would come and they would be like, I've never seen anything like this, right? Yeah, and I, and everybody said that. Like literally everybody said I've never seen anything like this. Like I used to feel that way, right? Um and you know, that's where I sent my children, right? I I literally like participated in the building of that school because I knew that I had to create a space for my babies. Um and um so anyway, uh um we we had no answer. Right? And 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 our answer was like come see Right, come see, right? Like, do you really want to see on a graph? Like, come see, like, and you can go anywhere. And, and like, literally, like, we won't walk with you. Just go anywhere, talk to anybody and see, like, nothing to hide, right? We are that confident in what you're going to see. Like, there's no, like, secret closet or corner, right? We are not going to see what we say we're going to do. And it's imperfect, right? And there's fights sometimes and teachers don't get along sometimes and all of that, right? This like any other family. So um, anyway, they um, they weren't having it. And they were like, no, you're like, you got to have test scores. Um, or else you got to have some other metric. And they're like, shit. And I'm like, Jeff, like you're a research. Like you need to just say like, you know how to like, so I was like, oh shit. Like, so we got to build it because we looked and we looked and we looked and so the first thing I would say is, is that if you look inside of education, you will find it wanting, but look outside of education because a lot of the fields that I mentioned in there, like I don't even read in education anymore. Like literally, like I read in pediatrics, I read in neuroscience, I read in like uh, in indigenous philosophy, I read in um, uh, physiology, I read in neurobiology. Like that's why I started to meet because these people are like, this shit is measurable. Like love is measurable, healing is measurable, wellness is measurable, right? And and now Western science is totally co-signing that, right? But our, our so look at um, there's a book by Linda Tahiwai Smith, a Maori um, scholar, um, sh called Decolonizing Methodologies, and it's um, and and you read that when you're in my class, so um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> But no, you don't have the whole book. So um, anyway, the, and in that book, she has 50 indigenous research projects, right? And because her thing is like, the, we, we've always been researchers. We've always been rigorous. We've always counted and evaluated. Like that's a part of indigenous practice. But suddenly this became the bastion of the university. So we had to like go there to learn how to do that, right? Instead of understanding that you that's your birthright. Like you already know how to do this, right? Um, but again, for me, it's a mixing of medicines. So then I looked at uh, and I met with a lot of these folks like Sapolsky and right, um, like uh, Bruce Perry has become a close friend of mine. Um, and um, to see the ways in which the medical field is measuring these things, public health is measuring these things all the time. So there are lots of metrics, right? And I started with um, Charles Schneider's work. He developed something called um, uh, the Children's Hope Scale, right? And he's like, hope is measurable. Right. And then you remember when Ob Obama uh, ran his presidential campaign on hope and, they, and then they're like, hope is not a strategy. And then and then Charles Sanders was like, but it's measurable, right? <laughs> which makes it a strategy. 
So um, anyway, so so we took our lumps and then we said, okay, well we're gonna we're gonna respond. So we spent myself and a, a group that I was uh, involved with for many years called Community Responsive Education or CRE. Um, uh, we gathered a, a group of um, elders, indigenous medicine people. Uh, Bruce Perry was in there, like M MDs, pedi pediatricians, um, parents, teachers, kids, uh, uh, principals, um, educational researchers, just uh, like a huge group of us. And we met um, uh, multiple times over the course of a year. And, um, and we um, first, we created a community definition of wellness. Okay, um, because we had to know what are we measuring, right? What do we mean? Because like who's, okay, you know, uh, raise your hand if you're against wellness. Well, it was, doesn't matter what circle you're in. Like and everybody's like, you know, like everybody's down for wellness. But when you say wellness and when you say wellness and when you say, we may be talking about totally different things, right? Like wellness is four cars and a, and a yacht and three houses and, right? And I'm like, that's sick -ness. Right. <laughs> so, right. You got to you got to have those conversations with your community. Right. Otherwise, you assert your definition of wellness onto a community. And again, that's where like, that's not foundational work. Right. That's laying it on top of an existing definition. So we, we spent a year. And we got this working definition, which is where when we go into schools to do like longitudinal work, that's where we start. Right. Is this um, getting to some community agreement around. What, what do we mean when we say wellness for our teachers and wellness for our children and wellness for our families? Um, and then what we did was out of that definition, we created, um, we worked with a psychometrician from Alaska, um, uh, EJR David, who um, created the first ever uh, uh, measurement tool to measure colonial mindset in people of color, right? Yeah, it's like, who knew you could measure that shit, right? He's just like, this is the advantage to getting like people that come through ethnic studies, people of color into um, PhD programs because they ask different questions. Uh, his name's EJR and his last name is David. It's spelled David, right? Yeah. So indigenous dude, right? He's University of Alaska now. Um, so we worked with him to develop um, at the first of its kind youth wellness index. And then we tested it with several thousand young people all over the country. Um, it is, um, and, and got it validated. So by the Western standard of like valid metrics, it, 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 it has, hits the gold standard. And there's two versions of it. There's a 29 item one and there's a 15 item one, okay? Um, and it is qualified to be used um, from third grade to 12th grade, right? Based on the, the, the psychometric standards of reading level and what have you, right? Um, and I have kindergarten teachers who are like, hey, can I try it in my class, right? And, and then they just modify it, right? The way that they use it, right? So instead of like giving the kid the test, right? Or the, the survey, they, they create like walls with the question and smiley faces and, right? And they just modify, right? The, the pedagogy and the curriculum. Um, but for it to be like valid, it's got to be, it, it's, it's valid for, for third grade and up. OK. Um, and so um, we're now in the process where we are um, myself, um, Maestro Jerry Theo and the National Compadres Network, um, Chris Chapman and the, the Kingmakers of Oakland um, and um, some other like individual scholars. Um, we're um, uh, we're forming a, a project called the Repurposing Schools Project, and we're going to choose two or three schools that agree to repurpose themselves to focus solely on wellness. And then we're gonna um, just do deep committed work with them over three years. And the metric that they're gonna use is, so this will be the first uh, research project ever using the Youth Wellness Index, right? To look at how it can shape curriculum, how it can shape pedagogy. So just a little more about the index. Um, so the way we've designed it is, um, and 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 um, CRE is still using it. They use it a little differently than I do. Um, so the the methodology that we that we are uh, planning to use is that um, you first of all, like every student, right, would take um, the the uh, youth wellness index, and um, so they would self evaluate, 
okay, on, on how well they're doing. And th the idea would be to do this three times a year, okay? So you get a baseline, right, score on every kid on how well they are, are feeling. Um, and we measure mind, body, spirit, and emotion, right? So there's, there's four. So the questions like pop up in different, right, elements of wellness. Um, but then what we do is we have the young person identify a friend, a peer, a homie that they feel like knows how well they are, best how well they are. And the homie, right, scores the kid. And then we have the kid choose any adult in their life that they feel like knows really how well they are. So it could be a parent, could be a coach, could be a pastor, could be a teacher, right? And then the, the distributing teacher, right, does it to get a school baseline. And so we get four different data points, right? So it's not like a singular score, but it's a complex conversation from multiple perspectives about how well is this child really, right? And then we work with the teachers to start thinking about how do you need to revise your pedagogy and your curriculum to move the meter on that metric, right? Um, and then we test again, we test again, right? And then, and then there, so there's the like, the metric learning process. And then we're also really trying to learn what does it actually take to repurpose a school, right? How would their budget need to look different? How would the start time of the day need to look different? How would the end time need to look different? How would lunchtime need to look different? Like everything's off the table. Not everything's on the table. Everything's off the table. And then when we put it back on the table, it's with one intention. How will this make children more well? Not sure, get it out. Get it out, get that reading program out, get that PE program out, right? If, you, if we can't, if we don't have clarity on, on how this is gonna make children more well, we will not do it. So um, this is very like, and this is the frustrating part because it's like, we need this now, right? We need this now. And my thing is like, we create these tools to share, right? Um, because the, the, it's, this is not propriety, right? Like this is about, really working with folks on the ground, not just to theorize, right? But to actually apply and do and change and experiment and, and figure it out. Um, and so I don't have clean answers, right? But when big questions like that come up, my response is always, okay, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to respond, right? Just to start a conversation in our community, right? About what is the metric? What can it look like? What can we measure? And I think people want a playbook, right? They're like, oh, I want to do this. So just tell me how to measure it. It's like, shit, I don't know, but I'll figure it out with you. And I think the, the key to the maintenance of this whole system is it's the oldest strategy of war. The oldest strategy of war is divide and conquer. And, and this profession in particular is incredibly isolating. And, and what I have the incredible privilege to do is travel all over the world and see all these schools and meet all these teachers. And then I come here, right? And I'm like, damn, like I need to get you a plane ticket to New Zealand, right? Because the stuff you're trying to figure out, somebody already unlocked that. And we're so isolated, right, in this work that, um, that we, we don't realize that, that most of the stuff that we're struggling with, somebody else has struggled with it and unlocked it. And if we can end the isolation and increase the connectedness, then we got, we got a much better chance, right? To get some shortcuts, right? Not to get a playbook, right? But to have people tell you like, we tried that and don't, right? It's, it, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose a leg doing that, right? So um, the more that we can stay connected, right? And that you all can stay connected. And you know, like there's the, the thing with the like, the glasses tonight, the what it was the, the, right the mix of the network right and i always used to be man fuck that shit i'm not going to that like i was, I was like, boy, like, but now i'm like oh, you got to go to that right and you got to leave this event connected to one more person right that you can keep building with because that's how they win right is that we we come here we pour ourselves in and then we just dip and we don't we don't continue that connection so i encourage all of you with with me right to, to keep the connection, um, even if it's like a year from now or five years from now, and you're like, hey, I need to tap back in and, and you know, ask him what, 
he's reading or whatever, please don't hesitate to do that. I, I will, honestly, I will respond. Or it, what also might happen is I might say, hey, actually, I'm not the right person, but I, but I know who you need to talk to, okay? So in all seriousness, like if you want to go to Tuparanga and spend some time with the Maori, I've sent any number of educators over there who were like, I want to learn, right, the, the real, right, practice from, from the originators of the practice. And, um, you know, see if your district will spring for a, an international trip to New Zealand, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a uh, baby girl coming in, in uh, about three weeks, November 15th, is she's coming. So um, the project's kind of on hold right now. Um, when we hit the new year, um, that's the question that we're going to answer. And so um, we're going to have some um, some gatherings to, to figure out the criteria. Um, and then um, in the spring, we'll release it. And then we'll make decisions um, so that when you hit the summer, you know, okay, we're going to be right. We're going to be starting this with them all. So um, the 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 short answer is like stay connected. Like I have a little folder in my email of people who have said, hey, when you are ready, when you send out the criteria and the applications, hit me up. So just shoot me an email and say, hey, I'm interested in being kept in the loop. And then um, when we're ready, you'll get an email from us about the next steps. Yep. Okay. Cool. I know. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause. Okay. So, so um, before we bail, um, it's, uh, there's a, there's a book called the Hagokure, which is a, it's a 15th century, um, Japanese text. Um, and it's the only book ever written on the ways of the samurai. And um, in it, uh, it says that the beginning and the end are important in all things. So um, how we finish, right? And the ceremony that we use to finish is, is important, right? To, to me and to my ancestors. Um, so um, I started doing this during uh, COVID because I couldn't figure out like, how do I end class when it's on Zoom, right? Um, and it just feels so weird to put like, you know, end what is it called in, in yeah in meeting right or in show right so um so i started um uh doing something uh a little different um i, I need my glasses or else some oh, of course they are my sons would love that <laughs> okay so um uh, I use this book. Um, this is it's called Inward from Young Pueblo. Um, he's got like four or five books out now. Um, his work is really dope, but I, I still think this is his best work, so I, I keep using it. Um, and then what I do is, whether I'm on Zoom or I'm in person, um, I just have somebody either put into the chat um, or um, say out loud a number between four and two hundred and twenty-four because that's how many pages there are. Okay, so. Okay, 25. So and it's just first one in. Okay. And the idea here is that um, this is this is the teaching that the ancestors wanted us to leave with. Okay. I don't control it. I don't know what it is. Um, and then the only thing I do, um, you, you said 25. Okay. So then um, you can see here, I just put the date that it's been selected. Okay. So 25 has never been selected before. Right. So what, whatever that means, I don't know. Um, anybody got a pin? Yeah, thank you. So I circle it and then I put today's date, which is what, 20, 25th, 20, 10, 25, 23. Okay, thank you. All right, and so here's the teaching. Um, I spent most of my life trying to prove to myself and others that I had no pain and felt no sorrow. One more time. I spent most of my life trying to prove to myself and others that I had no pain and felt no sorrow. So you make what you need to make of that, right? And why that was our lesson um, and the medicine that the ancestors wanted us to leave this space with. And I'm just grateful for having been able to share some palabra with you and spend some time with you. And please, I encourage you again to reach out if I can ever be supportive on your journey. <laughs>